Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session with True Methods and Alvik MSP Operational Excellence. Um, I do a lot of webinars on a lot of topics, profitability, sales, VCIO, metrics. Um, but I think this is one of my favorite ones because it goes to the core of how we run our how we run our businesses. So my name is Gary Pika and I am the president of True Methods and I will be joined hopefully shortly by Chrissy Little, the partner success manager at Alvic. She's having a couple technical problems, so um, my, my producer is working with her uh, behind the scenes. So hopefully uh, you'll see her pop up in just a, just a few minutes. For those of you that don't know me, um, I uh, have been in the MSP business for over 25 years. I have uh, owned and um, scaled and sold two MSPs myself. And for the past 10, over 10 years at, as the president of True Methods, work with thousands of MSPs around the world with our training, our software, and our peer to help them you know, maximize their potential in terms of growth and profitability. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we have this, it's a good tag along that you can use. If you go to truemethods.com forward slash science, you can get this ebook that we wrote on the science of world-class providers. So it's a good companion uh, as you uh, to have after you watch this uh, session. So we're gonna talk about MSP efficiency and to some degree, it should eventually translate to MSP profitability, right? And profitability is more critical in the current environment that we're in than ever before. And not just because, you know, the economic cycle ha has changed, but what we saw, especially at the beginning of COVID is MSPs that had low profit margins. And, and when I talk about low profit margins, I mean, you know, under 15% um, after a true owner salary, um, that some of them, when they had some impact, they either might have lost a couple customers or a couple customers were late to pay or or they um, uh, maybe their non-recurring services um, had a couple months when people weren't making decisions. So when these things um, happened, you know, they had to make some cuts and they had to cut into not just things that were, you know, excess, which is good. I think MSPs are leaner now, but they had to cut into muscle, which means, you know, they had to get rid of some things that, you know, weren't really the best decisions for the business or for their customers. So I'm saying today a true 10% net profit is the new break even. And if you couple that with the fact that, you know, you need to really make a lot of changes around the dramatic changes in cybersecurity, um, you need that profitability now and moving forward just to be able to keep pace with what's happening. Okay, so, and by the way, I didn't mention this, but we I have the questions pod open. So as, as we go through this, if you have questions, you don't have to hold them to the end. I will keep an eye on it and I'll answer any questions uh, as we go forward. So what if 25% of your total revenue was in the bank after you paid all of your expenses and you paid yourself an owner's salary? So we're talking about true 25% net profit. Think about that for a second. Think about for this year what you predict your revenue to be. You've already paid yourself your salary. That You get paid that for doing your job uh, as you work in the company. And 25%. So if, you were, if you're a $2 million MSP, that means that after your salary, you would throw $500,000 right to the bottom line. So this is what top providers, this is what I achieved in my MSPs uh, north of this. And this is where top providers are. And everyone has a chance to get there. It's just a math problem and an efficiency issue. And if you understand those things, you can get there. And uh, there's a concept that I teach in our training program that I call leverage. And leverage um, is really the right service delivery structure that creates efficiency. And efficiency creates profits. And leverage is one way to measure efficiency. And it's basically the relationship between your service revenue and the number of employees that you have, right? We want to generate the most amount of revenue, service revenue, whether it's recurring or non-recurring, with the fewest amount of employees. I think, you know, we can all agree on that. 
So leverage measures the relationship between employees and service revenue. And I'll give you two different type of leverage numbers here. One is overall leverage. I like this one because um, it, it doesn't leave a lot of room for interpretation like net profit and how people calculate it. So if you take, <clears throat> excuse me, all of your service revenue, recurring and non-recurring service revenue. So for most people, that's their managed service uh, revenue and their professional services revenue is normally what you would consider your services. And uh, you divide that by the total number of employees in your business. We want that number to be north of $150,000, okay? Um, if you take a technical leverage, <clears throat> if you just take uh, the amount of people that deliver your service, right, uh, and divide that, you want that north of uh, 250000 So what you can do is we like to have people calculate their unrealized profitability. So if you take the number of employees in your business and multiply it by 150000 and then compare that to what your annual service revenue uh, will be for this year, that's the amount of unrealized profitability that you have in your business. And you can do the same thing from a technical perspective. So, Chrissy, do we have you? You do. Can you hear me? Hey, how are you, Chrissy? Yeah, it's the uh, the Mac security settings that uh, threw me off there. So I do apologize. Uh, no problem. So, uh, Chrissy, maybe just real quick, we got started, but maybe you can just real quickly introduce yourself and your role at Allvic. Sure, I would have my camera on, but uh, it means that I'd have to restart my Mac. So uh, for the security purposes. So yeah, so I'm a, a PSM, um, which means Partner Success Manager at Orvic. Uh, I cover a mere uh, parts of Canada and uh, the US. So my main role is to um, basically help partners um, who are using Orvic as a product, product get the most value, um, which I always relate back to ROI. Um, you know, from the product. So to make sure they're like maximizing that. So a lot of the discussions we talk about kind of tool stacks and, you know, how how do they, um, you know, get the maximum from their operational efficiencies? How how can we make them more efficient as a, as a MSP basically? Awesome. So that fits in <clears throat> definitely. And um, in the concepts we'll talk about today, we will use, um, you have some general concepts you've learned about efficiencies you'll share, but also we'll use uh, all the, as an example, right? And they can apply the process and how they look at tools to all their tools in their tool stack. So I'm glad, I'm glad you're on today. So here's one last thing I want to talk about with leverage, just to make sure everybody understands this important concept. The average MSP that has a million dollars of service revenue a year, they, they might have product and some, you know, resell some cloud services and things that aren't, you know, um, delivered, right, services. Um, but just in service revenue, they have a million dollars, they have 10 employees, they generate about $100,000 annually per total employee. You know, we set a target of a minimum of 150,000. So that same 10 person uh, MSP would have 1.5 million. And there, coincidentally, there's that $500,000 difference throwing it to the, uh, you know, thrown, thrown to the bottom line. So really dramatic. So you can gauge yourself where you are right now relative to this. And then we're going to show you how to unlock over the next, you know, 45 minutes. We're going to show you how to unlock uh, where to find that unrealized profitability and how to and how to get it out. Some of it you can do, um, make changes right now to do it. And some of it will take, you know, more time. That's more on the pricing side. All right. So uh, today I brought Chrissy with me. Um, these lovely things here, these are my leverage goggles. So these are the goggles you put on to be able to look more critically at your uh, business. Pretty cool goggles, don't you think? <laughs> you like those? They're lovely, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. So here we go. Little example. Uh, Dear True Methods. Uh, I have an opportunity for a sale for $8,500 of MRR, so $8,500 a month, but I have to place a person there full-time on-site, and the on-site resource will cost me $5,000 a month, fully burdened. Should I take the deal? So if let's do this. If people can go over, we'll see if people are listening. If you can go over into chat, and if you would take this deal, type in a three. 
Type in three in the chat if you would take this deal. We'll see. Because I'm going to give you an answer for it. People may be not finding chat. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully we'll get some people on there. We had a bunch of people on. They can go over to chat and type in a three. So let's let's keep going through this. All right. So, dear true, this is my response. Dear True Methods member, I don't know. Should you love the True Methods team? Now, here we go. We're getting some threes put in there now. All right. So here's the answer. You will bill a hundred and two thousand dollars annually. And the tech will cost you 60000 so you'll make $42,000 a year. Chrissy, that sounds pretty good. If you answered yes, right, if you typed in a three, you are correct. Definitely. Yeah. Here's another way to look at it. Um, if, you, if your technical leverage that I showed you that example of is 250000 and it should be 250 to 300,000 in a, as a managed service provider as an average then um, you'll build this resource at 102,000 you're losing in this scenario you're losing almost 150,000 so if you said no Chrissy you are correct i was thinking no gary for sure good good it, it, here's what it is Okay, this is what it comes down to. Um, in that first example, at uh, you would be at 40% um, gross margin on this deal. But in your managed service model, you should be under this ratio at 75% gross margin. So in this case, I'm not telling you you should or shouldn't take this deal. What I want you to do is make sure you understand the impact of taking this deal. And uh, I have something, Chrissy, in our uh, training portal called Ask True Methods, and that's where this came from. But I get asked this question in different ways um, almost every week. Sometimes it's for a resource, or sometimes I'm asked the same question, the same concept about, hey, our, you know, our seat price is $165 a seat, but we have this large deal, and I was going to do it at $120 a seat. Should I take the deal? The concept here is the same, right? Um, it's a matter of, well, do you want to be a 40% gross margin services business, or do you want to be a 75%? Because they're very different businesses. I won't tell you which one to choose, um, but if you ask me, would I take this deal? Knowing what I know of running MSPs and training them for 25 years, absolutely not. I do. I I see 40% gross margin businesses, and um, you you'll never get above you know 10 or 12% net profit with it. Like the math just doesn't work. So your view of this deal tells you how you view your resources. It also tells you what your real expectations are for the leverage you want to drive. So. What, whichever you're going to do, I want you to have your eyes wide open. So you need to put on your leverage goggles and you need to make informed decisions. Does this make sense, Chrissy? 100%. And we experience it with partners a lot, Gary, as well, when they talk about how they sell their managed services and what prices they sell it for. So it definitely makes sense. And the ones that um, have the higher revenue uh, tend to actually do a whole lot better um, than the, the, the ones that take that 40%, so. Yeah, and in the end, listen, I would rather run, you know, a, a, a $2 million MSP that throws 25% real margin to the bottom line than run a $4 million MSP that throws 10% to the bottom line. Um, I, it's And it's probably just as valuable, um, and I'll be home for dinner every night which I also like. So you want higher margins, but you have to drive leverage. You want more service revenue for employees. So what you need to do in order to do this, and again, this is at the center of um, uh, the True Methods training platform and our framework. And this framework that I'm gonna show people today, Chrissy, it's used by over 20% of the um, Channel Futures 501. So. This is a proven concept here, and it's simple, not always easy, but it's simple to understand. You need to relate each person on your team, and your, like service delivery, to a role, or if you're smaller, it could be a function. 
And then you need to be able to relate the role to revenue. And then understand what are those factors that allow you, that you need to focus on to increase your leverage so that each role can touch more revenue. Here's the five service delivery areas that we use, okay? People might name them differently um, and they might have them combined, but pretty much, Chrissy, we've gotten feedback you know, pretty wide feedback. This really covers most things. And we'll talk about maybe security uh, as well and how that overlays, but centralized services. So Alvic, this will be part of it. Your RMM, you know, your growing tool stack, okay? And so that would be all your tools, but it would also be the labor to manage those tools. Uh, technical alignment, some people call that compliance. So that would be um, the grow, this is probably the most, the area that's growing the most right now because of you know the dramatic changes in cybersecurity. You need to be able to compare your customers against uh, standards, do the gap analysis and, and be able to close those things. Virtual CIO, being able to, to guide, again, this is another growing area. Um, our customers are um, have more complex technology, they need more advice, support, that's the business we've been in for a long time, end user support, and professional services. Again, also the implementation of new things. You know, and normally for most MSPs, um, the, the four that are larger here are what you bundle into your monthly fee, into your, into your seat cost and price. And, and for most people, professional services uh, is still um, uh, a billable service. They bill that outside. So having service deliveries and understanding them allows you to, better package and price because you can, can know what your costs are. Uh, it'll impact sales because you can show people the value of these roles and match those roles with um, the results that you get. It impacts the quality of your service and, and obviously what we're going to talk about today is leverage and efficiency. So we call this economics, and basically we take these roles and we want to know what the relationship is um, between these roles and cost per seat. Now, I'm not going to review that today. That's a packaging and pricing webinar we do. We call that micro economics. <clears throat> We're going to focus on leverage. That's macro economics. So, you know, how much revenue should each of these roles touch? And then what are the factors that allow you to become more efficient, more efficient with them? And the reason we want to have service delivery areas is that um, people can have more uh, direct roles and, re and responsibility. They can have clear accountability of what their job is and what success looks like. You get more consistent delivery. You're able to separate proactive and reactive tasks. You can manage cost drivers better, increase efficiency, and ultimately drive your leverage up. So Chrissy, this is um, some guidelines that we give around this. For every $60,000 of recurring revenue, um, you should have a support desk person. So if you have $120,000 of recurring revenue, um, you should have two support desk people. If you have four, then your leverage is only 30,000. Uh, VCIOs, you sh they should be, if you're doing it right, they should be able to manage over 120. Because um, these, because the um, average size of a client is increasing, we actually see people that can have VCIOs manage 150 or 180,000, but we set that target at 120. If you're doing alignment or compliance, they can manage about 80,000 of MRR. Centralized services, that one's real scalable, Chrissy. Um, you know, the, once you roll out AVIC, right, and you're managing it centrally, right, it doesn't care, right, whether you're managing 50 or 500. Uh, endpoints, correct? 100%. It's, it's standardization. It comes if you're standardizing what you do, it makes you more efficient. Um, yeah. and, and obviously, the time factor as well. You reduce time on everything you do across all you know, your base, then time is revenue. Yeah. And so, with centralized services, like this is the big leverage point, right, of how we generate more revenue by using our tool stack. But you got to, as we're going to talk about, we're going to go through each of these. And when we get to that one, we'll talk about what's so critical right now because um, tools, well, you know what? I'll save it and I'll talk about it when we get to that piece rather than bring, rather than talk about it now. And then finally, professional services is a simple one, right? And about every twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars that you, on average, bill per month of non-recurring uh, revenue, you would want to have um, uh, one professional services person. So what you want to do is 
like what should your company look like and this gives you an idea of it and then what does your company look like today and you know where are you out of alignment and then you can we'll start to talk about why and we'll dive into each of these but this will give you a good gauge as to maybe why you're not more profitable and more efficient than than you need to be than you should be or would like to be so you want to match your people to delivery areas based on skills who fits in what delivery area who doesn't fit and why um, and where are the holes one exercise we do in some of our training is we have everybody list all their service delivery people down uh, on a piece of paper and then we have them draw the five delivery areas and we have them start putting people in boxes and when they're done they have people with no boxes and boxes with no people and we usually tell them Chrissy that's probably a good place to start so there's a good exercise that everybody uh, can do just to kind of see where you are today one other thing I want to mention before we get into each of the areas is something we call containing the noise like the main thing I see with like MSPs at any size who gets stuck. They get to a certain revenue level and they kind of get stuck there, which is common. We call them impact zones. Um, normally, it's because we see everybody doing everything. <laughs> so you're on the support desk, you're running out and doing an escalation, you're managing a tool set, you know, you're, you're doing a professional services, you know, you're, everybody's wearing all hats and you haven't started to split up those functions and so you want to keep all of your tickets and alerts contained onto one board or queue and so you can get metrics and manage your efficiencies there if you don't you know the person who runs the tools you know they ha they have some tickets your professional services people you're escalating things to them your vcio like everybody has tickets um very inefficient way so we want to contain that noise and we want to put it all here in reactive support. So we want to funnel all reactive tickets through the support desk, calls, emails, alarms, so that we can dispatch and we can manage expectations centrally. We can have an escalation process that we can also manage efficiently. We can start to put time limits on tickets when you relook at them, and we're going to drive up our efficiencies on this. So here's managing some metrics. We would like to have um, each support desk resource be able to manage for the 500 seats. What I would tell you is you definitely want to be above 300 seats. So if you're managing you know, 900 seats today and you have more than three people on your support desk, um, you've got to dive into these other metrics because your cost per seat for support is so high it's going to keep you from being competitive. You're spending too much of your seat uh, price on support, and it, it really creates a problem. So but you want to look at your tickets per tech per day. You want to, on average, be able to close at least 10 up to 15 tickets per day per support tech. You want to look at your response time, your resolution time, you know, tickets that go over a certain time limit that you set because they tend to drive, drive that up. Also, Chrissy, here's one that most people don't look at. Ticket touches, like how many times you touch a ticket. So you go in, you work on it. Then you go back, you work on it again. You escalate it. Somebody else touches it. We call this um, ticket fondling. And so the idea is we want one-touch tickets. We want to have the right person on that ticket, and we want them to bring as many of them to conclusion on the first touch as possible. That might be one of the most important stats that no one tracks that really let you know what's going on and why you can't close those tickets and then escalations we're trying to you know minimize or eliminate um tickets escalating off the board does all of this make sense yeah it does gary there, there's one thing i want to add to that and the ticket the ticket inside of things um is is sops they they you know our partners speak about making them more efficient in dealing with tickets. So if they do get two touches, that then that's two touches. It's not, yep. you know, three or four. Um, yep. And it also just clarifies everything they need to do. Absolutely. Really good point. Awesome. I'm glad you fixed your sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And here's a couple questions you said um, that you like to ask your partners that you work with. Yeah, hundred um, percent. It really makes partners think. So, partners that measure metrics are generally more successful, right? 
Um, so we we ask our partners this sometimes when they're onboarding, sometimes you know when they're when they're you know they've been a partner for a while. Um, you know how how do they how do they measure success in their company? You know do they measure it you know through different metrics? Are they kind of time based? You know how, how do they do that basically? Yep. We come back to four things. You know operational efficiency leads to growing revenue, leads to minimizing risk, and it also leads to um, happy customers and, and building them relationships as well so it's really important to obviously uh, measure because uh, that that's how you succeed that's how you you grow um, and then obviously how do your so sometimes this one has never uh, you know popped up in their mind before but how do your customers measure success in, in their company how does that happen do they have SLAs do they meet SLAs do they have regular um, contact with their clients, you know, how is that mes mes measured, um, you know, and that minimizes risk as well. So, yeah. and, and most of the time it's not today for most MSPs, it's right. It's not SLAs. Um, usually that's not how the decision makers, you know, measure it uh, today. So having some measure of success, can I tell you one, um, whether your customers are happy with you that we use, that's maybe a metric, it's maybe counterintuitive, but we found it to be yeah. accurate. Um, we look at the ratio between what your monthly recurring revenue is and how much on average per month non-recurring service revenue you have to that base. And we want to see that ratio be north of a minimum of 20 to 25%. So if you have $100,000, of monthly recurring revenue, you should be generating, you know, at least, you know, let's call it $25,000 of non-recurring services, not product, just services to that base. And the reason why this tells you is if you're not, you don't really have a valuable relationship with the customer because you're either not making recommendations or they aren't accepting your recommendations. And I get a good gauge of this because um, we manage 150 MSPs um, around the world in our in our peer groups, and um, we have a benchmarking platform, so we track every mix, and, we, and this is one of the ones we calculate. So I get a good idea of the thriving MSPs and what that what that ratio looks like, and those that um, maybe aren't thriving today. Uh, interesting, right? Definitely, yeah. And and asking questions like that is is key, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to go into centralized services, and um, you know, here one thing is you got to assign a resource. I see some people that have a tool stack, and they have like they assign engineers to like certain customers, and then they run it for those customers. Like it's disastrous. So one person has to be ultimately accountable for what you do here, and you have to have if it's not a dedicated role, um, you at least have to have dedicated time blocked on this. Right, even if it's part time, and you got to put a rhythm in place for reviewing and 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 you know maintenance items right around those basic things, and then manage that rhythm through aggregated metrics. You have to know and have some metrics about what good looks like. And so, um, you know, uh, Lena said, "Hey, I, I, I'm on the road to building centralized services," and he said that their company is kind of a little bit of a black hole right now, and so interested in it. And they want to make Alvik a good part of it, so interested from that perspective. So, yeah, we'll we'll use Alvik here, uh, Chrissy, as an example, but then I'll explain yeah. how the things you're going to talk about here in the next few three slides really um, uh, really apply to every tool that you would have. Yeah, hundred percent. We we talk about tools in in a tool stack, not not just Orbic itself, because they yeah. all work together, right? Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. You want to talk to this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so in regards to your tools, um, we talk about tools um, providing uh, automation, you know, on the Orbit side, that the monitoring with the RMM. So we talk about tools in, in that respect as ROI time. So it's them operational efficiencies and going back to what Gary said about metrics. So how many people can, um, you know, you have using tools to, you know, optimize everything you do without tools you're going to need more headcount if you don't have tools but tools just don't work on their own so they're going to need some implementation 
um, when we work with partners, we, we, we always try and um, create an implementation project with them. So it's implemented properly, everything's configured right, how they want it, and it's always best spoke to their, their goals. So it's all about ROI and saving that time. So that comes back to Gary's point on the staff and how many, how many head counts you need per, per role and working that, that metric out. In regards and, to know, what, what I was going to say is one thing that's important here, Chrissy, is um, one of them, again, another metric that we track is we look at what percentage of average seat cost, right, or yeah. average delivery costs, uh, COGS, right, um, is uh, tool stack compared to labor. And if I go back three or four years, it was probably 10 to 15 percent was your, uh, you know, as a percentage, your tool stack. Now it's 20, 25 even up to 30%. So understanding this and doing it efficiently and making sure that it's driving leverage in services is more critical today than it's ever been in my time in this business. Yeah, and the implementation and the measuring is super important. Because if you don't measure, you don't measure what you're doing before, you don't measure what you're doing after, how do you know if you, you're, you're creating that, that revenue, right? Yeah, so this is pretty cool. We're not gonna go through every bullet point here, um, but but um, just kind of go through the, the, the headings on this, because I think um, you have six of these, and I thought it followed a really good logic. Yeah, so just quickly, and just as Gary said, just a headliner. Um, so when, when we onboard new partners, we go through a, a, a plan, like a project plan with them to get them onboarded using the tool properly. So we start off obviously discovering adoption, discovering what their goals are, you know, what they use, their KPIs, you know, they're, they're kind of metrics, like they're starting metrics, right, prior to Orvic, um, maybe with another tool or, or, or with none. Then we look at like streamlining, you know, Orvic within within their stack. So it, it's not just about our tools, it's it's about, you know, their stack and how that integrates because integrations equal streamlining what they do. So we look at things like SOPs, um, you know, building reporting processes, you know, we have these conversations. Step three is is looking at aligning our, our our product as as best as we can. So after 60 days of the partner being with us, we look at aligning Orvic um, in regards to what they want to achieve. So problems that they had prior to Orvic, so we look at their problems um, and obviously solving them problems. So it's all about kind of KPIs and around about that cost saving, that revenue, that time saving is like the key piece of that um, align yeah. aspect. I think we've got the next slide, which is, oh, there it is. Um, so yeah, so then we go into, um, you know, reoccurring, like looking at the operational effectiveness of Orvic in their tool stack. So look at like baselines, look at improving their KPIs, also building out their managed services. So we have a lot of partners say, well, we can build out our offering now. If they can build out their offering, they can also charge more for that, that um, you know, uh, service. Then on number five, so, ongoing kind of metrics, so we reassess what we're doing. So we look at the MTTR, so we look at the KPIs. Um, this is obviously, you know, depending on how the partner uh, wants to work with us, we don't force them to do this stuff, obviously. So, but you know, if we can keep tweaking as we go along, um, you know, and try and make sure they get the 100% the value out of Orbic and not the kind of 50%, that's where we want to go. In regards to six metrics and performance, so we want to, you know, Orbic to be a success, we want, um, you know, we want them to be delivering like the highest ROI possible. Um, and there's different ways we can kind of have them conversations. Um, but yeah, so it's, a, it's about the whole from basically from their service packages and what they offer all the way through to operations and, you know, out the other side, basically. So I'll give two examples here. One is Ovic and one is non-Ovic. So the Ovic example is um, like network diagrams. Right. So one, are you doing network diagrams up to date for every one of your customers? If you don't have that, I mean, it really increases your risk and also your cost of support. Right. Because people don't have the information they need. So if you don't have them, there's a cost to it. Or if you're doing them maybe manually. So what would be the impact? Right. In, in this case, if you could have those both automated and completely up to date, think in those ways. Another example is, you know, you look at um, you know how you attach like what you're using to whether it's your RMM or a third-party tool to, to be able to start a remote session. You know we always had a stopwatch on it, 
and said, okay, from the time we press the button to connect, how many seconds is it before we start that session? You know, we're doing 1400, we were doing 1400 tickets a month, right? Um, when we were, when we were, um, you know, managing 7,000 endpoints and, you know, a, a few seconds one way or the other would translate into days of time. So think about everything in that kind of way. And the way you laid out this logic is really applicable. So um, just real quick, maybe there's a lot on here, but maybe just uh, how this, um, you know, kind of matches up with what you just said, basically. Sure. Yeah. So with our new partners, we go through a partner journey just to make sure they're on track to basically get the most out of the product um, as quick as possible. So it, it's task to value. This is a task to value map, which then builds into us making a plan with the partner. So we, it's a best quote plan following the, the last slides. So we go through these kind of steps with them and we, we have these discussions of what they need um, going forward. So when they've got these steps in place or, or are thinking about them and, and planning them, um, you know, that makes you know them more successful instead of just giving them a, a product. So it's just having a plan, right? And and with existing partners, I use this 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 um this journey to basically find any gaps. So we didn't have this, we haven't had this for long. So I go back, I talk to partners, talk through these steps. Are there any gaps in this? Because it's all about, you know, streamlining and aligning and, and, and then tweaking them services um, to get that ROI and deliver them efficiencies. So we do work with partners to generally, you know, try and increase their operational efficiency, um, you know, as all the part of that stack with integrations and everything else. So. Yep. And so it's great you're doing this, but if you're working with other partners that maybe aren't to this point, you can use this as a template um, for all for each of the tools you have. So really good job. Thanks. Thank you for really uh, taking that centralized services piece and, and making it come up, helping me make it come right. alive. Um, so let's move on to technical alignment. Again, you might call this compliance. You may or may have not have this as a role, but it's definitely a function. Like at the minimum, you know, you need to know where every one of your customers are, for example, against, you know, CIS at the minimum, right? Um, you need to know where they are um, in terms of against your standards for, you know, backup, other key security things. So I say now you need to assign a resource or at least if you're smaller, have dedicated time. You need to build and manage technical standards library. And this is the key right, in your securities approach and also in reducing ticket counts. Alignment across customers, symmetry equals efficiency. So schedule time for these alignment reviews far in advance and make this role accountable also for documentation. So really important. Um, you know, again, you have all your general standards, plus you have a lot of security standards today. So this is really, really critical. And this is just an example. Have some way of tracking them. This happens to be our software, my IT process, that has a standards library. You can do it in a bunch of ways. But again, you want to be able to make sure you do this in a way that you can um, do it on a regular basis. It's not an onboarding task. I mean, this is something you have to do on an ongoing basis because things change and people move in and out of alignment. Super important. So here, some of the key metrics is how many reviews uh, are completed in a given time frame. Um, if you have a tool you're using and there's an alignment score, are we moving the customer's alignment score in the right direction? Is all your documentation always up to date? Um, uh, and customers and MRR managed. So again, with every one of these, we wanna know how many customers and how much recurring revenue one person in this role can manage. We gave you those guidelines. And then VCIO. Again, here you got to assign a resource or at least have dedicated time. This is about the business impact of technology. So you want to techno you want to schedule. Some people call them QBRs. I don't like that word because um, there's some customers you might have your most active customers that you that you do this with monthly, and there's other ones that only have to be done once or twice a year. So it's not necessarily always quarterly. So we call them technology strategy meetings. You want to schedule them at least a quarter in advance. Um, and if you have our tool, my IT process, obviously you can manage this. Uh, inside of there. One of the questions that um, that we were asked uh, with this is from uh, Mark, can you clarify the thriving ratio? And so Mark, what I had said was, if you look at your recurring revenue base and you have $100,000 a month of recurring revenue, 
you should be in general you should have about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars per month of non-recurring services so professional services that are implementing changes for recommendations you made and the customer accepted them and the way in which you do that is you know you want to have a a, a strategy roadmap and this is a picture of, of, of what that could look like where um, your customer is accepting recommendations for like future quarters. You don't want to be in a scenario where a VCIO is going out, telling them something's wrong, handing them a proposal, expecting them to sign it right then, and then they expect you to do the work tomorrow. We want to be planning a roadmap. And when you do that, you can be able to look a quarter in advance to see uh, how, mu how many hours or how many dollars of accepted recommendations you have in the future and so that's a really good gauge of, of where you are today and just make sure that every customer you know has a roadmap that would be one of your goals to be able to track with this so again the metrics here are how many decision makers are you meeting with like you should be meeting with actual decision makers that control the budget and strategy for your customers at every account or you're not a VCIO how many strategy meetings do you hold how many recommendations have you made and are accepted? How much non-recurring uh, you know, service revenue are you generating? And again, how many customers and how much recurring revenue can one person in this role manage? So Chrissy, I can't tell you how important this is right now more than ever, okay? Yep. Everyone, if you're an MSP, every one of your customers over the past year should have been making decisions um, about just around, you know, for, well, one, how they're going to do business moving forward, right? Like many people now are in a hybrid model about where their apps, you know, reside, premise or, or, or cloud, about what this, their security posture is across all of this. Um, if you aren't doing a good job here, Chrissy, you are susceptible to churn and you're susceptible to security risks that maybe again could be you know very detrimental to 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 the business does that make sense yeah 100 percent. i was um speaking to a partner actually funny enough last week and in regards to missing this role they don't have this role and they were explaining it as a big gap and a big risk because they are they are not using their tools, they're not standardizing what they do, that they're, they're making mistakes in regards to the, the risk side. So yeah, 100% that, that drops your revenue for sure, not having that role. Yeah, and I can tell you in the two MSP successful MSPs that I built, you know, they scaled and they were profitable and I was able to exit them both. Basically, in both of those scenarios, Chrissy, what I said was, we gotta be good at all the other delivery areas because they support being able to do this, right? But we were going to be the best at this anybody in our marketplace nobody was going to build more valuable more strategic relationships with a customer than my msp like i prioritized it like and no one was better at it we were the best and because of that our customers didn't care whether we charged them three thousand a month or four thousand dollars a month because the relative value and them feeling like these investments they were reducing their risk they were making investments to help support their strategic you know plans in their business it just makes all the difference uh, in the world um we call this role a service delivery manager chris I, again it might just be terminology but to me, a service delivery manager is ensuring that your services get delivered properly to the customer. The VCIO role is to understand the customer's business and make the right recommendations to them so it is not an in-facing on your service delivery. It is completely customer-facing. So I, I really want to make sure that, that we have a good distinction there. And then finally, the last one is, is, is project or professional services. And this is all about scheduling time, um, you know, making sure you're including things on every quote, like project management time, standby, documentation, testing. So getting the quoting, you know, right on this. Um, you should have a backlog. So if you have, you should have a backlog, and that means um, recommendations or quotes for projects that were accepted that you have not implemented yet and so that you can schedule them out and you want to be scheduled out with professional services 
I mean, a minimum of four to six weeks and, and our best uh, MSPs you work with, they're scheduled out, Chrissy, eight to 12 weeks in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You can only do that if you're proactive in your recommendations. If you're uh, reactive, then um, they want everything in installed tomorrow. Uh, Darren said they're scheduled out 12 weeks. I'm like, yeah, man, that's great, Darren. That's awesome. Um, if you do that and you do the rest of this well, you should be able to be at, you know, 65% gross margin or hit those leverage numbers we talked about pretty easily. So kudos on that. Some of the key things you look at here are utilization rate. Um, you should be doing survey scores. And then really the VCIO relationship, you should be able to get an idea of customer expectations. Like when they, when they signed off on the, on this, what was their expectation of what the outcome would be? And did we actually meet that? That's more important sometimes than what you do technically. So these are the kind of things you want to look at from a project standpoint. And then here's the last thing is if you want to be efficient, we have a video in my training. We have about 150 hours of role-based training on every aspect of building a top MSP in our, in our training portal. One of the videos that's really popular is called not all MRR is good MRR. So if you want to quiet noise and increase efficiency, you need to have your resources focused on your good clients. So you want to identify your top clients based on you know, the right uh, service offering, the right price. So we have a little um, spreadsheet. We have them put all their customers in, how many seats are for each customer, what the um, monthly recurring revenue is, and then we have them do a measure of like like maybe over the what are the what's the average time on reactive tickets over the past three months and we do some calculations to tell them kind of like what the MSP effective rate is so they can see and when I bought my second MSP now I didn't work in that one I invested in it while I, during the time I've run um, uh, true methods so we only you know provided the strategy and when we went through this process what we realized early on was they had about 50 customers and Chrissy we were getting 70% of our gross margin from like 15 of them so we were like hey you feel like you're overwhelmed because there's more customers than there are of us guess what starting today we have 15 customers that when they say jump we say how high everybody else we're going to help best effort and then over the next three years we either fixed or replaced those other customers that were lower in gross margin are you with me on this yeah definitely yeah instead what happens is you have good customers and bad customers you might not know which is if you're not tracking it you might not know which is which and you're treating them all the same and so your best customers aren't getting the service they deserve because you're treating everyone the same. This is huge inefficiencies. And we would look at this every quarter, Chrissy. Mm, yeah. So in summary, you want to organize, define roles and metrics using the guidelines we've given you. Focus, prioritize those clients, do that today. Um, then uh, you want to be able to uh, manage. So you want to be able to lower your, when I say noise, I mean all of those reactive tickets through focus on those proactive areas, VCIO, alignment, and centralized services. Then you can scale. Start adding the right recurring revenue at the right price. I mean, one thing I tell people here, like in the U.S., and it translates pretty closely if you use the exchange rate um, over to the U.K., um, is – if a minimum, if your average seat price right now and you're offering a full fixed face, you're doing all the things that we just talked about today, you know, those four areas of, you know, centralized services, VCIO, alignment and support, and you're below $150 a seat, I can tell you based on the math, um, your customers aren't as secure as they need to be. So this is really important that we drive efficiencies. At the same time, we're driving up value to command a higher price. That's the secret. That's completely the secret to this business. So finally is, what should I do first? This is the main question I get so often. So start by going back and you re look, look through this video again and look at those support ratios, right? Um, and contain that noise. Review client seat price and ticket levels. Um, focus on that VCIO process to generate that non-recurring revenue. What, what happens, Chrissy, when you do that is that one, your profitability goes up because you have more 
you know, non-recurring revenue, obviously. But the other thing is you're getting your clients in alignment and your cost per seat for support is going down when rev and your value is going up. So when yeah. revenue goes up and costs go down, in most businesses, that's a good thing, right? Um, consider either firing um, or fixing low profit customers over time. And I'd say look at it when you need additional capacity. So the time comes when you got to spend six grand a month on another resource. Do you want to spend six grand a month on a resource or do you want to get rid of $6,000 a month of clients that would free up capacity of a resource? Because in the short term, they both net your bottom line the same, but you're going to be running a more efficient and more scalable business. And then again, uh, you got to be able to add new recurring revenue at the right price. And the good news is right now, if you understand these principles, more recurring revenue is being added at a higher price today than any time in the 25 years I've been in this business. So this is the gold rush. Yep. So if people want to get a hold and uh, learn more about all the care, Chrissy. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. We, we're, we're here to talk to existing partners about becoming more operationally efficient um, using Orbit, but other tools as well alongside that and how we optimize um, the value in that side. And anyone obviously thinking about, um, you know, coming on Orbit to have that, the, the networking piece that, you know, will make you more proactive on that side. Yeah, definitely get in touch and, and we can have these conversations. So Awesome. And then here we had this uh, go to uh, truemethods.com um, forward slash science, no E in true for true methods. And you can go ahead and get this or, um, you know, go to our website, truemethods.com. Again, we offer um, training for MSPs that's really inexpensive because it's video based. Uh, we have our um, software, my IT process, that will help you with alignment and VCIO. It's basically does it you know, allows you to manage those roles. Also, we have industry peer groups. So if you're not at currently in an industry peer groups, um, the people that are in peer, they grow faster and they have uh, higher margins and higher valuations. So it's something you can look into. So if you go to truemets.com, you can check out those things. Um, and Adam asks, will we send the recording? Yes, we will send a recording to everyone who registered and attended. So uh, pretty good. We're right at the reaching the top of the hour. Unless we have any other questions, Chrissy, I think this was went by fast, right? Yeah, super quick. <laughs> awesome. So I think we answered every question. Okay, here's one. Uh, one la let's answer one last question. Here, um, a client who does not want to do anything you tell them to do, you identified in your VCIO reviews, and any other you know, type of review you do, um, but want to argue with you, the clients, you know, listen, here's where you are, Darren, different than before. Like if I tell a client, like, listen, we need to do these three things. You need to pay me an extra 600 bu bucks a month because uh, I'm rolling out some additional you know, endpoint protection. We have to, you know, have uh, security training. We need to do multi-factor authentication, whatever it is. And the client is saying, well, I, I don't want to do it. I don't want to invest in it. I think you first have to look to yourself and you have to say, I'm obviously not articulating what's happening and, and the risk because your client's costs have already gone up. They can assume it in the form of risk or they can make an investment to you know, share that risk and, and be able to reduce that risk. If you go through all of that, Darren, I don't know that you can even afford to have some of those clients. And this is why a sales engine is more important because they're a risk to you and maybe other, you know, other clients. And you do not want to be in a lawsuit. Um, I am uh, Chrissy. Each Monday, I am on a um, cyber cybersecurity podcast for MSPs called the Cyber Call, and. Um, you know, this is what we're dealing with all the time. I mean, cyber attacks are up 600 yeah. percent. So definitely this is one of those things, Darren, it's a great question and you have to command the right price. And what we found is if you know how to present it and you can explain the risk and tie it back to your roles and your tools so they can see the investment and how it's going to you know, mitigate that risk. 
very few customers are saying no. I had one of my members recently, they went out to their 50 customers and they made a, a about a, a $12 increase in seat price and um, they got 100% acceptance across 50 customers. So if you're not experiencing that, again, it's either the way you're explaining it uh, or the way you're either explaining the risk or how you're gonna address it in a tangible way. All right, Chrissy, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, brilliant. Everybody make it a great day.